1956, being deployed to Cyprus and Malta ahead of Operation Musketeer, the joint Anglo-French-Israeli military operation aimed at seizing the Suez Canal from Egypt. Starting on October 30, 1956, Canberra's conducted bombing and reconnaissance missions over Egypt and Syria for six days. In 1944, as World War II was shifting in favour of the Allies, the Royal Air Force's most accurate bomber was the twin-engined de Havilland Mosquito. Unlike the heavier four-engine bombers, the Mosquito utilised its speed for defence against enemy fighters. This prompted the idea of a jet-powered bomber that could fly high above the enemy lines and remain largely out of reach from attacks. Teddy Petter, renowned for designing the Lysander, Whirlwind and Welkin, earned the Ministry of Aircraft Production's trust through Westland's Spitfire successors, leading to his key role in the B-144 jet bomber project. Without an official contract, Petter designed two prototypes with jet engines internal to the fuselage, reminiscent of the Mosquito. After persuading Westland to fund a fuselage mock-up, the company wasn't interested in his project. Disheartened, he resigned and joined English Electric in Preston where he assembled his ideal team and resumed work on the bomber project. Developing a jet bomber from scratch was a formidable task for any company, but for English Electric, it posed an especially daunting challenge. They were essentially starting from ground zero, which meant constructing new infrastructure from scratch, including wind tunnels and converting the Wharton airfield into a flight testing facility. Initially, Petter's design featured a single large jet engine in the fuselage with wing route intakes, However, this configuration left insufficient space for fuel and bombs, prompting a design revision. The new specification called for an aircraft with twin Avon engines, a two-person crew with ejector seats, and performance significantly surpassing that of the Mosquito, speeds up to 440 knots at 40,000 feet, with a 50,000 feet ceiling, 1,400 miles range, and equipped with both radar and visual bombing aids. By 1947, progress on the project, now known as the English Electric A1, was swift with detailed design and a wooden mock-up already underway at Wharton. The design still bore traces of the old Westland influence, but featured engines in wing nestles to facilitate potential future engine replacements. Unusually for the time, much of the aircraft was constructed using custom jigs and tooling from the beginning, rather than starting with a handmade prototype. Petter's strategic team selection was clearly effective, as by early 1949, the first prototype was nearly complete. The air staff, impressed by the progress, placed orders for five different variations of the aircraft, replicating the Mosquito's most successful versions. The first full flight took place without incident, aside from complaints about a jerky rudder and the excessive heat in the cockpit due to the canopy design. Petter dismissed the heat issues but addressed the rudder problem by modifying its balance horn and adding a fairing behind the canopy to eliminate vibration during high-speed flight. By September, the aircraft had successfully completed its testing program with minimal issues, and English Electric confidently showcased it at the Farnborough Air Show. Despite experiencing a flameout during taxiing, the aircraft delivered a remarkable performance, showcasing the aircraft's speed and agility at the air show. The display was well received by representatives from various air forces. However, the airshow committee found the demonstration too vigorous and asked the pilot to moderate his flying. Meanwhile, the new bomber was named Canberra as part of a marketing strategy to appeal to the Australian market, with English Electric's leadership selecting the name to emphasise the importance of the Commonwealth and its furthest capital. The Canberra soon set a world record in January 1950 by reaching an altitude of 50,000 feet with its second prototype. But soon after, the outbreak of the Korean War heightened the need for increased armaments production, which had dwindled post-World War II. The Canberra was one of the projects selected for accelerated production, but English Electric lacked the capacity to meet the new demand alone. As a result, other established manufacturers like Avro were brought in to help produce the new bomber. The first model planned for service was the B-1, a blind bomber designed for radar navigation. However, due to delays in developing the necessary equipment, the Air Ministry decided to switch to a traditional visual bombing approach, using a glass nose for bomb aiming. The B-1 was subsequently cancelled, and development shifted to the B-2, a tactical bomber that would also serve within Bomber Command's strategic main force. 
In January 1951, an official naming ceremony for the first production B2 model was held, with Australian Prime Minister Menzies performing the honours. The B2 model then began service with the 101 Squadron at RAF Binbrook in May 1951, where it gradually built up its presence and experience over the following year. Despite the high performance of the jet, there were concerns about its effectiveness due to the lack of bombing radar, questioning its ability to accurately bomb targets from heights of 40,000 feet using only visual aiming. The need for a photo reconnaissance variant led to the development of the PR-3, which was similar to the B-2 but featured modifications in the front fuselage to accommodate cameras. The T-4 trainer version, with side-by-side -side pilot seating and no bomb aiming transparency at the nose tip, followed. These trainers were also distributed in small numbers to various B-2 squadrons. The target marker variant, the B-5, was developed but eventually cancelled due to shifting requirements and doubts about the aircraft's precision bombing capabilities. Nonetheless, some enhancements from the B-5 prototype were integrated into an improved B-2 version, the B-6. The Canberra proved to be an extremely versatile and high-performing aircraft, contrasting sharply with contemporary fighters like the Hunter and Swift, which underwent numerous iterations before achieving satisfactory performance. In service, the Canberras gave fighter squadrons a difficult time as few could match its high-altitude speed, and only by flying straight at prearranged speeds could aircraft like the Meteor engage effectively. As a bomber, the Canberra was no more accurate than the piston-engined predecessors, but its speed and relative immunity to fighter attacks enhanced its effectiveness as a weapon system. English Electric continued to refine and enhance the Canberra, with the B-6 featuring stronger engines, improved brakes and additional fuel capacity, while the PR-7 offered similar upgrades to the PR-3 model. Initially, the Canberra experienced typical serviceability issues for a new aircraft, including critical problems with the tailplane actuator, which led to several fatal crashes before the issue was resolved. As the aircraft began to mature, there was some resistance within the government regarding further improvements, as the Canberra was increasingly seen as a temporary solution pending the introduction of the V-bombers. With the development of faster enemy fighters, the Canberra's advantage of high-altitude speed was becoming less secure. Squadrons adapted to this by shifting to more effective low-altitude bombing tactics, especially in Central Europe where cloudy conditions often obscured high-altitude visibility. A new version, the BI-6, was developed for these operations, featuring a belly gun pack with four 20mm cannons, while bombs were mounted on underwing pylons. However, the design reduced visibility for pilots during low-level attacks. The Canberra saw its first real combat in 1956, being deployed to Cyprus and Malta ahead of Operation Musketeer, the joint Anglo-French-Israeli military operation aimed at seizing the Suez Canal from Egypt. Starting on October 30th, 1956, Canberra's conducted bombing and reconnaissance missions over Egypt and Syria for six days. The raids followed a typical World War II night attack pattern, which might have evoked disturbing memories for any German civilians in the area. Within the first two days, the Egyptian Air Force was effectively neutralised by attacks from the fleet air arms carrier-based aircraft, allowing Canberra operations to proceed with minimal opposition. However, the bombing accuracy was poor, except during daylight attacks. Fortunately, losses were minimal, with one lost to a Syrian MiG-17 and another destroyed during takeoff when returning to the UK for repairs after a raid. In Europe, during the tense periods of the Cold War, the ultimate version of the camera for interdiction roles was the BI-8, which featured a redesigned nose that raised the pilot's seat and incorporated a fighter-style canopy offset to the left. This design, however, left the navigator with reduced space, confined within the fuselage without an ejection seat. Instead, navigators were equipped with a chest parachute and expected to exit quickly through the standard entrance door in an emergency. As the 1960s began, the RAF started looking towards replacing the Canberra with the BAC TSR-2, thus limiting further investments in the Canberra to only those necessary to extend its service life sufficiently to maintain a competitive edge. The B-15 and B-16 variants were introduced in 1961, essentially enhanced B-6s with advanced navigational equipment and a broader weapons capability, including rocket pods. The B-16 also featured the Blue Shadow side-looking radar, 
which cost the navigator his ejection seat, necessitating manual exit similar to the BI-8's navigator. By 1962, as the V-bombers began to assume more of the RAF's strategic roles, the use of the camera, particularly within the main force of Bomber Command, began to decrease. However, it continued to serve in more tactical capacities within the RAF's Middle East, Near East, and Far East Air Forces. A noteworthy variant that emerged was the PR-9, a significant enhancement over the earlier models, first flown as a prototype in mid-1955 converted from a PR-7. This version was a more sophisticated reconnaissance aircraft with several modifications, both apparent and subtle. The pilot section featured an offset fighter-style canopy that opened, and the navigator was positioned in the forward nose, equipped with an ejector seat accessible via a hinged nose cone. Although early models lacked this feature, and a tragic accident during a test flight resulted in the loss of a navigator, the PR-9 had an extensive wingspan, larger inner wing sections, and the most powerful camera engines to date, the Rolls-Royce Avon 206, along with standard powered flying controls. In performance terms, if the camera was likened to a sports car, the PR-9 was akin to an F1 car, remaining a challenging target for even supersonic fighters. With an impressive range of 2,000 miles, a service ceiling exceeding 50,000 feet, and up to 5 hours of endurance, the PR-9 marked a significant advancement in reconnaissance capabilities. Despite the cancellation of the TSR-2 in 1965, and the diminishing global influence and reduction of the RAF, the Cambra relinquished its strategic and later tactical bombing roles to the V-Force and the Buccaneer, respectively, disappearing from RAF bomber service by the late 1970s. If you enjoyed this content, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe for more, and ring that notification bell to stay updated on our latest posts. Thank you for your support.